Thank you very much and good afternoon to everybody. Thank you to the entire organizing team of Diabetes India for this wonderful show. The topic that has been given is actually very, very apt in today's times. We are, we are in an era where we are talking a lot about drugs <clears throat> which would not cause weight gain, which would uh, reduce weight, where we can have remission of diabetes. And uh, therefore, uh, what topic I am going to talk about is related to that weight gain with anti-diabetic agents. So, we, uh, this is my conflict of interest for this talk. So, we all know that diabetes is a heterogeneous and multifactorial disorder. It's a disorder which is uh, a combination of lifestyle, combination of genetic factors, environmental factors, uh, interplay of insulin deficiency, insulin, uh, interplay of insulin resistance and which ultimately leads to hyperglycemia over a period of time, leading to metabolic syndrome. Over a period of time, a patient lands up with hypertension, dyslipidemia and then gradually micro and macrovascular complications. Genetics play a very, very important role actually for an individual to determine how that individual will further progress whether he'll be, uh, whether his weight would remain constant, whether he'll gain weight over a period of time, and therefore it is very important for the kind of therapy that we are subjecting a patient to. Apart from lifestyle, obesity has become one of the very, very important risk factor to, for a person to develop type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. We know that uh, a person who gains weight over a period of time has a high chances of developing diabetes in the future. Interesting study done on a uh, huge population of 77,000 females and 46,000 males from the nurses health data which showed or which looked at the risk factors that in develop for, uh, with, over, with overweight and obesity and compared individuals between BMI of 22 versus BMI of more than 35. And what it showed was that over a period of time, all practical diseases, be it gallstone related issues, blood pressure, hyper dyslipidemia, coronary disease, and diabetes all were at an increased risk almost more than 4 to 5 times as compared to for patients who had BMI less than 22 versus 35. BMI is directly and continuously related to the risk of type 2 diabetes. We know that for it compared women basically in both the categories, there was a 5 times higher incidence in those with an BMI around 35 and 28 times higher in those with BMI around more than 32 and 58 times almost higher in those with BMI more than 35, which clearly tells us that weight becomes such an important issue for a person or for our patients with diabetes. Diabetes and obesity are related and that term called diabetes is now very well known. It was coined long term back in 1973 and they are closely related because there are again multiple factors which are correlating both of them together be it insulin resistance, hyperglycemia, the cycle of insulin resistance, and compensatory insulin secretion, which ultimately leads again to more and more weight gain and thereby leading to again further deterioration of blood sugar levels. So this is something which we are going to see in a long time and it is something which uh, is going to rise over a period of time and we need to give a lot of importance to this. Now weight gain and anti-diabetic with anti-diabetic medications again is well known. If you go two decades back where we had only insulin, where we had only sulfonylureas and metformin with us, two out of the three agents were some responsible for some amount of weight gain when the patient started taking them. So, uh, it's only after the advent of DPP-4s and SGLT-T2s and GLP agonists, now we have drugs which actually do not make a patient gain weight and in fact lose weight. So, most of the therapeutic agents or classes that we have been using in the past were responsible for this. If you look at the landmark trial data, uh, it had patients who were put on sulfonylureas, insulin and metformin and clearly the data showed that those patients who are in the, ins in the sulfonylurea arm and in the insulin arm gained considerable amount of weight at the end of the study. It clearly, there was almost a 2.8 kg weight gain in the sulfone patients who are on sulfonylureas and almost 4 kg weight gain for patients who are on insulin uh, comparatively. If you look at the UKPDS algorithm, there were around 1000 patients each on sulfonylurea and insulin, while around 300 patients approximately on metformin. And those patients who were in the intensive arm or were controlling the blood sugars tighter, what they saw was that at the end of the study, there was definitely a reduction in HbA1c, but at the same time, there was a weight gain of around 4 kgs uh, at the end of the study scene. So, which again, this was attributed to more of hypoglycemia and more of snacking, which happens with uh, tighter blood sugar control and the agents per se. 
Now, insulin secreta gobs that we have been using for the last more than four decades, we know how they work. They basically work by stimulating the pancreatic beta, the SU receptors, and cause more of insulin secretion. The mechanism of action is such that it can further lead to hypoglycemia and thereby again more snacking and more weight gain. So, in general, sulfonylureas are known to cause weight gain, but again, there is a differentiation in this. The older generation sulfonylureas, the glibenclamides, and uh, the older ones were known to cause more weight gain, while the newer ones like glimepiride and glycoside, which are slightly more selective, do not cause hypoglycemia as much, are responsible for slightly lesser weight gain comparatively. Head to head comparison has been done in the guide study between glycoside and glimepiride. Again, showed that the A1C reduction between the two was not much of a difference, more or less similar between both the arms. And both the arms showed a re relative weight gain of around 0.6 kgs in both the arms caused by both the sulfonylureas. So, it is there again with that, but relatively lesser as compared to the older ones. So, the safety and efficacy of overall low dose glimepiride has also been tested in various studies. And it was found out that the weight gain with glimepiride again was subjectively lesser as compared to the older generation ones uh, as comparatively. This is an eight week uh, data uh, done on patients who were initially not on glimepiride and then added glimepiride. It had another arm of patients who were already on glimepiride and treatment new patients also. It was an eight week non-interventional cohort study which looked at the effectiveness of glimepiride on A1C as well as on other parameters. What it showed was that, uh, again, the weight gain that was associated was negligible in the glimepiride arm on those patients who were put on this and the HbA1c reduction was relatively good. And uh, the weight, it clearly showed that the newer drugs comparatively gained less weight, caused less weight gain. The major culprit related to antidiabetic agents and weight gain we know is thiazolidin dions. The way it works, uh, we know that it's a powerful insulin sensitizer. It works mainly by stimulating the PPR gammas. It causes an increase of adipocyte differentiation. It causes a free fat, uh, fatty acid influx. It causes increase of adiponectin. And all these factors are responsible for the hyper uh, to reduce the blood sugars as well as have positive effects on the lipids as well as on increasing adiponectin. The increase in body weight that happens with pyoglitazone is well known. If you look at the data from proactive trial, there was around a 3.6 kg weight gain seen in the trial in the patients who were on the, in this study. But interesting was that those patients who gained weight actually were the ones who did better as compared to patients who did not gain weight in this. So the weight gain is of, with, that happens with pyoglitazone again is directly correlated to its positive effect of reducing blood sugars or doing, giving a better metabolic control. Now, the, uh, the theory or the reason behind weight gain are multiple again with pyoglitazone. It is supposed to be due to an edema that happens uh, with this, which could be because of the reduction of sodium excretion. It happens, again it happens because of the, it is thought to be happened because of the alteration in iron transport in the intestines. There are some theories or some data which have been seen with rosiglitazone and in the past which showed that there was a genetic locus uh, disturbance in, in the patients who gained more weight as compared to patients who gained less weight on rosiglitazone. So, multiple theories which are there related to this. There have been studies which have been done with low dose of pyoglitazone again 7.5 milligrams to see whether the effectiveness of pyoglitazone remains same and whether the adverse effects remain same. So, one way of uh, helping our patients is to use a lower dose of pyoglitazone because what has been seen in various meta-analysis done with 7.5 that the HbA1c reduction was found to be more or less similar. The beneficial effects on lipids was found to be similar. But the weight gain that happened with 15 and 30 milligrams was much more as compared to 7.5 milligrams. This is again the mechanism by which they both act. We know that they work by stimulating the PPR gamma, overall improving the insulin sensitivity. So, so, the beneficial effects with 7.5 remained same, but the weight gain edema effects were found to be much lesser. Interesting paper by Dr. Panikar and Dr. Sashank Joshi, which looked again at the effectiveness of uh, three strains of pyoglitazone, 7.5, 15 and 30 milligrams for, uh, in certain group of patients. Again, HbA1c reduction was more or less similar in all the three categories. The weight gain effect, there was a huge difference between 15 and 30 milligrams and a huge difference between 7.5 and 30 milligrams and not much difference in the weight gain between 7.5 and 15 in this study. 
so one way of using this drug is to use or you know, tell our patients to maybe use a lesser dose of 7.5 and it might still help our patients in the insulin sensitizing effect but cause less weight gain alpha glucosidase inhibitors are supposed to be more or less weight neutral or some of times have caused some amount of weight loss in some studies because of its again mechanism of action uh, acarbose in one of the studies in type 2 diabetic patients caused a, caused a small amount of weight gain and in type 1 it was found to be neutral in which it was studied. One small paper published with Woglibos which looked at uh, patients uh, in different arms where uh, patients were initially put on diet and exercise and Woglibos and after 3 months of therapy they were added pioglitazone. And interestingly, what was seen was that those patients where Voglibos was already present in these patients and then pioglitazone added, the weight gain was much lesser, around 0.8 kg, while those patients where Voglibos wasn't there from beginning, the weight gain was much more. Again, theory behind this is not very clear. It could be related to a reduction of hyperinsulinemia, which had happened when the patients were initially only on Voglibos and metformin. But uh, one theory was that, that this could be the beneficial effect. Now, insulin we know is a, a tool which we have to use in our patients over a period of time. The progressive nature of diabetes is such the beta cells do get exhausted over a period of time and patients may require insulin therapy. The main fear regarding insulin for in the minds of our uh, physicians and everybody is hypoglycemia and weight gain that can happen with insulin. Various mechanisms have been associated with weight gain with insulin, the reduced energy, reduction of energy loss that happens due to correction of glucosuria, increased lipogenesis that happens due to loss of the first pass effect of insulin when it is given subcutaneously, decreased satiety factor which is lost in type 2 diabetic patients. Insulin is known to signal to the brain to cause satiety but in type 2 diabetic patients again that factor is lost. Anabolic effects of insulin, defensive snacking because of high fear of hypoglycemia as well as hypoglycemia that actually happens and genetic predisposition. So all these are reasons why our patients on insulin gain weight over a period of time. Frequent hypoglycemia and snacking has been one of the most common reason. If you look at the data from DCCT and UKPDS also, this is what was considered to be the most common reason. Interestingly, there have been studies been done with uh, where they have tried to compare the basal insulins like Detamir, Glargine with NPH. Interestingly, what was seen at that time was that Detamir caused the least weight gain in those days compared to Glargine and NPH. Again, no clear indication, but when they again compared dose to dose, Detamir require, requirement was found to be higher to reduce the same amount of A1C as Glargine, but and therefore the weight gain at the end of the study was found to be similar. The root of insulin again matters sometimes. This is a some paper where they compared uh, intranasal insulin versus basal bolus. And uh, again, A1C was decreased by around 0.7 in both the arms. But no weight gain was seen in patients who were using inhaled insulin, where a gain, well, there was a gain of around 3 pounds seen in the patients who were on subcutaneous insulin. Now coming to the newer therapeutic agents, we know that we have been using these newer drugs because of the various advantages. From the time DPP-4 came in, we know that they are more or less weight neutral. GLP-1 agonists, from the time they come in, they, they have revolutionized the way we are using these drugs. Exenatide came in much earlier and now we have dulaglutide as well as semaglutide and SGLT-T2 inhibitors which are known to cause weight loss. Nothing needs to be told about the mechanism of action of GLP but that is a tool which we are using very effectively, injectable as well as oral forms. We know that they can cause increased satiety, they cause uh, gas, uh, stomach em increased gastric emptying and the way it works, it causes weight loss per se. Liraglutide in various studies, this is a study which has been done in patients with you know, obese patients where liraglutide was compared to Orlistat and what different doses of liraglutide was compared 1.2 to 1.8 and clearly the weight loss effect was more powerful in liraglutide in all arms as compared to Orlistat as well as placebo. Step 2 results from so with semaglutide, again a 68 week data and should looked at the change in HbA1c and it looked at the change in weight and effective blood glucose reduction as well as weight reduction seen with semaglutide at the end of the study. And categorically all the group of patients in this arm lost considerable amount of weight.
SGLT T2s we know that they work in the way they work causing osmotic diuresis they cause glucosuria a person loses more than 300 calories per day and that's how a person on SGLT T2 reduces weight as well as there is a loss of sub, uh, visceral fat as well as subcutaneous fat that we see effectively in this subset of patients so if you look at the anti diabetic agents and its impact on weight we have more or less insulin, sulfonylureas, the secreta, the secreta gogs, repaglenide, netaglenide, and thiazolindiones, which are the ones which are more or less responsible for the weight gain aspect. While the DPP4s, SGLT T2s, GLP ones are more or less protective in that aspect. So, <clears throat> when we are looking at a patient who, where we are considerably want or want to avoid weight gain, we know that the ADA criteria also tells us that when you are looking at a patient to bring down A1C and where weight gain is not, where weight loss is one of the area that we should look at, we know the choices that we have in front of us. If you look at the medications that we need to be reduced for a, in, from a prescription, we need to try to bring down the doses of insulin by adding uh, different drug combinations. It has been seen that when you use a pioglutazone with metformin, the, automatically the weight gain is lesser. But if you are using a pioglutazone with a sulfonylurea or an insulin, the weight gain automatically is more. So these are the factors which we need to remember when we are prescribing such drugs to our patient to avoid mm. weight gain as much as possible. Use of drugs like deuraglutide, oral semaglutide, GLP organoids, different ones and SGLT2s have become more or less the primary drugs to look at when we are trying to avoid weight gain. Reinforce the diet and physical activity to our patients, especially to avoid weight gain. Lay stress on exercise as much as possible. We have to understand that, uh, that we need to make a general choice of anti-diabetic drugs to avoid the weight gain and more or less uh, imp importance is to lay stress to our patients and talk to them more, more and more about it. Measure the waist hip circumference, measure the weight regularly at every visit, look for edema, look for other parameters which would trigger weight gain, test for other areas for that could be responsible for weight gain like thyroid in a patient of ours. Use and dr drugs like liraglutide, duraglutide, and SGLTD2 as early as possible. So, to summarize, type 2 diabetic patients over a period of time generally gain weight not only because of the, uh, the blood sugar way they manage themselves and lifestyle, but also because of certain drugs. Most of the therapeutic class of medications that we have been using in the past were responsible for weight gain. Weight gain with thiazolidinones is more or less a class effect and more or less mainly related to improved metabolic control as well as the edema that happens. Edema is one of the mechanisms which is responsible for weight gain in TZDs and uh, the weight gain with insulin is more or less multifactorial due to various factors. Avoiding hypoglycemia, avoiding frequent snacking would overall help our patients to avoid the weight gain. Thank you very much and just an invite to our event happening next month in Mumbai, uh, CID 2.0, it's on the 6th and 7th of May uh, at Grand Hyatt and uh, from all our UDF family, Shadi Mezarurana. Thank you.